Uh, today, I'm giving a presentation on the development and service history of the ICARA anti-submarine missile, uh, which to date is Australia's largest and most complex weapons project undertaken. And in many ways, it was a trailblazer for Australian, not only Australian defence industries, but Australian manufacturing and high technology industries as well. Now, at the end of the Second World War, the experience mostly gained from the Battle of the Atlantic by the combatants was the need for escorting warships, warships escorting convoys or, or, or large carrier battle groups, for example, the need to create an effective standoff anti-submarine war capability, which basically, um, which basically meant that the warship that was attacking the submarine would not be attacked in turn by the targeted submarine. And for that matter, the submarine was be unable to close on its primary targets being convoys or large warships. Now, as it turned out, the, the real impetus, and indeed the ancestors for this, um, for this problem, or the solving of this problem, I should say, came from Hello. Germany in the Second World War. And um, if we go to our first slide, which is not assisting me, if you would just, we go to our first slide, which is the first of the German inventions in the second half of the Second World War, known as the Fritz X guided bomb. This is an anti-shipping weapon launched from an aircraft. It was uh, introduced from 1943 onwards. And the Fritz X, as it was known, along with another German uh, rocket-powered glide bomb, the Henschel 293, were truly revolutionary means, or were two truly revolutionary weapon systems for uh, engaging surface warships. And mainly because of the fact that, that they were rocket powered and they were radio guided. So the uh, operator, the bombardier, would sit in the nose of the plane, he would have a joystick and he was guided by flares on the missile and he was able to pinpoint the missile right into the target at ranges between two and five miles. Now these two uh, weapon systems happen to be uh, extremely effective uh, the uh, largest target that was sunk by them was the um, Italian battleship Roma, um, almost 50,000 tonnes, which was hit by a FX-1400 uh, on its way to surrender to the Allies on the 8th of September 1943. Uh, the missile hit the ship in its magazines and exploded them and destroyed the ship with very heavy losses. Other heavy losses were inflicted on allied shipping in the landings in Italy and also casualties were inflicted during the Normandy uh, campaign. Now, let's just turn now to the uh, early post-war period, 1946. And this was a totally new challenge, a period of totally new challenges for the naval powers and more generally the military powers of the world. And that was because of the advent of a nuclear power, atomic weapons, guided weapons, and ballistic rocketry. Now, the Empire, or the British Commonwealth, I should say, is response to this was an initiative called the, the Anglo-Australian Joint Program Project, which was set up at Woomera in 1946. And Woomera was to be the test establishment for a whole range of weapons and weapons designs. And alongside Woomera was the, also the establishment of the what became known as the Weapons Research Establishment at Salisbury in South Australia, along with Woomera. Now, at this time, there were a number of very highly qualified Australian scientists who were recruited to the joint project. And one of them was this gentleman here, Dr. William Butamant, who you can see third from left in the picture. Budiman was born in New Zealand. He migrated to Australia at age eight. And during the Second World, during the period before the Second World War, he became an expert in beamed RDF systems in Britain. He was a key participant in the establishment of the Chain Home Radar Link, which was extremely important in the conduct of the Battle of Britain 
Uh, he was one of the senior inventors of the wireless microwave transmitter for battlefield use, the modern walkie-talkie. And he was also a key inventor and participant in the development of radar-directed proximity-fused AA ammunition, which was used extremely effectively in the uh, latter stages of the war against V1s attacking England and also in the Marianas uh, campaign in the Pacific. Buderman was the first chief scientist of the Department of Supply, which was the Australian government department tasked with the procurement of new weapons, a leading figure in the joint project. And he was also a key figure in the British ABOM project. He headed the site selection committee for all the test sites in Australia. And this photo in fact was taken from uh, one of the tests that was uh, undertaken in Australia. I believe it was EMU Field. Now, Buderman received some very sage advice from the uh, British chief scientist, Sir Henry Tizard, in 1949, who visited Australia to um, get an update on progress in the joint project. And Tizard basically advised Buderman and his staff that the best means of Australian contribution would come from niche weapons projects, and in particular, guided weapons. And this was or I should say became the chosen field for um, Australian research under the joint project. Now, one of the very early initiatives was the Jindavik target drone, which is still in service today, a highly capable um, a tar targeting, um, a, a, a targeting system. As you can see rather similar in appearance uh, to um, a V1, the German V1, and these were manufactured in Australia and indeed exported overseas quite successfully, including to the United States. The true um, ancestor, if you like, of the um, ICARA as it was to be, however, was this system known as the Malkara Hornet Missile System. Hornet being for the Humbler Hornet, which was the vehicle, as you can see, the missiles uh, getting my pointer here, were on a rack on the back. And this was a remarkably successful project because at the time, the British and other NATO countries were desperately searching for effective anti-tank defences to counter the overwhelming advantage held by both the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact armoured forces in Eastern Europe. And this proceeded during uh, throughout the 1950s uh, according to British specifications, not Australian specifications. And that was because the Australian Army had actually rejected uh, Malkara because they felt it would be unsuited for warfare in jungle conditions. However, the British uh, continued on with the project. And uh, by uh, 1961, the system was ready for production. And eventually 700 weapons were delivered to the British Army's strategic reserve. Now, many of the scientists and technicians that were involved in this project were eventually to go on to ICARA, and the, um, and, including Dr. Budiment. And um, it demonstrated both to the British and elsewhere overseas that Australian scientists, science and technology was certainly up to the task of producing a very highly high quality guided weapon systems. Now, interestingly, adaption of Malkara for an anti-submarine capability began in the early 1950s. However, it was scrapped fairly soon because there was no suitable available homing torpedo. And it was not revived until the mid to late 1950s, uh, mainly through the introduction of the British Mark 23 homing torpedo and the American Mark 44 homing torpedo. And as uh, events would transpire, the Mark, 24, the Mark 44 was eventually preferred because it was felt by the both um, the scientists and the RAN that the uh, Mark 23 torpedo from Britain was simply too slow for its projected uses. Now, at this time, there were two other systems in development, the development stage for anti-submarine warfare. The first of these, was the American ASROC ASW launcher. And you can see a picture there of the, of the launcher itself, which is, is still in operation in various um, variants today. And the second 
was the less well-known Malathon, which was a French initiative. And if one examines this, we can see here that the torpedo and the rocket were very similar in concept to the idea placed by the, um, put in place by the Germans that essentially they were a hull. The Icara, by contrast, was to differ from this in that Icara was to be eventually, as conceived, a carrying vehicle for the torpedo to be launched externally while still in flight. Now, these um, projects were considered very high priority in the, um, in the period, mainly because the Soviet submarine fleet was growing apace and the United States Navy in particular was concerned about the large numbers of Soviet non-nuclear and nuclear powered submarines which were appearing and the obvious consequences for the United States Navy in and for that matter, the Royal Navy and other navies in dealing with a very large Soviet submarine force. So after uh, some initial um, <clears throat> thinking and drawings from the, uh, the design from those who would eventually be tasked with ICARA, some baseline drawings were concluded. The first, as we can see here, was basically a, a slightly um, modified version of the Malathon. And as you can see, the torpedo and parachute would be at the front of the weapon. Uh, the, then you would have the wing, the wing and tail surfaces. And following from this, some more schematics were drawn up as to proposed configurations. Now, the notable thing about these configurations, and using my pointer here, is that it allowed for the either full recess of the torpedo, as can be seen in the second and bottom examples, and a partially recessed torpedo in the top and third examples. You can also see various configurations for the um, propulsion system as well, on, on the top of the missile and at the bottom. Wow. So by 1959, a baseline plan had been prepared for study by the Department of Supply. Now, in, um, in gaining approval, two hurdles had to be cleared. The first was getting the approval of the Defence Research and Development Policy Committee, known as the DR, and the second was obtaining the approval, in much more difficult circumstances it proved, was from the Defence Committee, which was the joint government and military committee tasked with reviewing new projects. Now, at this time, in late 1959-1960, there was considerable friction between the Navy and the government and the Air Force, for that matter, over the future of the RAN's fleet air arm. And this was because the Air Force were attempting to convince the government that the, Air, that the RAAF could manage the defence of the fleet on its own, and as such, the Navy had no real requirement for its two existing aircraft carriers, HMAS Sydney and HMAS Melbourne. So the stage was set for a fairly epic showdown. In the blue corner for ICARA was the one of the major supporters, along with Dr. Buderman, Vice Admiral Sir Henry Burrell, then Chief of Staff, who had been carrying much of the load in the uh, discussions over the future of the fleet air arm and other naval assets with the government. And he was supported by the Minister for Navy at that time, the Right Honourable John Gordon. And Gordon turned out to be a very enthusiastic supporter of the project and was extremely adept at um, persuading his colleagues of the merits of this project. In the red corner, however, were the two major opponents to ICARA. The first of these being Lennox Hewitt, later Sir Lennox Hewitt of the Department of Treasury, who is popularly known as Mr. No. And he was the Treasury representative on the Defence Committee. And the second was Air Chief Marshal Sir Frederick Sherger, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and later of the, uh, the Chief of the, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as would, would be described. And Sherger, was a very interesting character. He was absolutely committed to um, the paramounts of air power. He had very little time for naval projects that seemingly challenged 
the RAAF's jurisdiction in the air. And in many respects, he was the Australian equivalent of General Curtis LeMay from the United States, in particular, his advocacy for a um, nuclear capable uh, RAAF bomber wing. In any event, the, it took several meetings which were to, um, to approve the project, and eventually it was. It was approved by the uh, Defence Minister Athol Townley in nine, November 1959, with strict guidelines enforced on, budget, on budget, both budget and the acquisition of materials. Now, at this time came the, um, with, with the approval of the project, came um, a naval staff requirement. This was the originating document that would basically determine the configuration of ICARA. And we will now pop the description up on the, on the board. The basic configuration as the naval staff requirement stipulated was for a maximum range of 20,000 yards, a desirable minimum range of 1,000 yards. It was to be able to carry a Mark 44 or the later Mark 46 American to homing torpedo. It was to have an independent radar system, that being independent of the ship's radar system. It was designed, it was intended to be light and compact in its structure. And it had to be launched within 30 seconds of warm up and remain on alert in the launcher for 30 minutes thereafter. Crucially, the final, one of the final stipulations was that the firing solution was to include external information from other warships and helicopters, which in due course was to come known as XDAC. Now, in this period, there was no digital computerization as far as this project went. It was an analog system. And if we now see, if you can just point in the pointer for the tailplane, the majority of the electronics for ICARA were to be maintained in the tail structure. So it was from the tail that would communicate to the launching ship and through which um, command guidance would be established. Now, moving on, these were the general components of ICARA. You might like to note here that at the rear of the torpedo, the section at the rear of the torpedo was a parachute. The torpedo could simply not be dropped into the water free fall because it would shatter the warhead. And if we go now to the guidance system outline, as originally conceived, you'll see in the middle the computer, which is an analog computer aboard the firing ship. It would take, it would input information from external sources, its own sonar, and all of this information then would be transmitted to the missile. And so the missile's course could be varied in flight. It could actually be, it could be splashed in flight. But remembering that this was through an analog computer. And one of the problems with an analog computer was that the information from the external sources had to be communicated via voice means or Morse, and therefore instantaneous uh, course corrections and updates on the sonar position of the submarine could not be given. So that was going to be something of a drawback under an analog system. The other drawback, which was recognized from the start were the sonar characteristics for ICARA. Because it was anticipated that the Type 70 and Type 177 sonars from the United Kingdom would be used aboard the um, Type 12 frigates, which were slated to accommodate ICARA. The difficulty was that these particular sonars did not have particularly um, accurate long range capability. And this was to be a problem for ICARA until the mid 1960s uh, with the, uh, the origination of digital technology, which tended and more updated sonars, which uh, tend to alleviate the problem to some extent. Along with the studies that were being undertaken at the time was one into, as I explained, the payloads. And also there was a theoretical studies being undertaken at HMAS Watson by the project team. Now, at this point, I should note that the project team was drawn from a number of sectors. 
uh, including the RAM, uh, the Weapons Research Establishment, and other establishments, including the um, Australian Research Laboratories and the Government Aircraft Factories. And from private enterprise, uh, the EMIE company, as it was then known, which today is known as EMI. And it was recognised as vital to the guidance component part of the project that private in industry be involved as much as possible. Now, how were the trials going to be conducted? Well, before re reaching that, we at last see um, a mission profile. Just briefly, the missile would be launched. The payload would release would descend by parachute. And with the aid of the external sources, the homing torpedo would then search for and attack the target submarine. Now, the submarine aboard would be stored in magazines under the deck, as you can see here where the pointer is the missile magazine, and then to its left, the missile assembly room. So the magazines would be stored there with the aid of overhead uh, clamps would then be transported into the assembly room where the tail services would be affixed. And then it would be placed backwards into the launcher and then the launcher would be elevated. So this was the basic configuration as planned during the, during the initial stages. Now, the ship that would carry out the first trials was the HMAS Stewart, which you can see here during her fit out of Cockatoo dock to, Dockyard. She would be assistance, assisted in the sea trials by HMAS Kimbler, and Kimbler would act as the support ship and general workshop for the scientists who were undertaking the trials. And the trials themselves would take place at Fairfax Island, in the bunker group just off uh, Bundaberg in Queensland. One can note from this picture that the sand spits on the end of the both the small islands, it was one of these sand pits, or sand spits, that um, uh, detection, uh, detection of, um, finding and other equipment was installed for the ICARA tests. And at this point, I'm going to show you a short video which will explain uh, considerably better than I can the uh, entire pro uh, process of testing ICARA both at Woomera and at sea. By February 1961, first flight trials on 0.6 scale missiles were being conducted at Woomera to prove aerodynamics, flight characteristics, components and design studies. Meanwhile, proving tests on the torpedo release system and parachutes were carried out in the wind tunnel. Static drops by helicopter. in flight drops from a jet aircraft. Solid propellant motors were developed and test fired. In our flying laboratory, guidance tests were stepped up. At the Australian Army proof range at Port Wakefield, trials are underway to determine the extent of the damage caused to the Icara ship's magazine should the rocket motor of the missile be ignited by enemy action. <laughs> <laughs> 
tests show that suitable arrangements can be made to reduce the damage to the ship's magazine. December 1961, the first full-scale unguided missile was fired at Woomera to prove the launcher, telemetry, blast effect and components. Shipboard firings then started. We were now ready for full guidance flights. By April 1963, all was ready at Woomera, the tracking receiver aerial. The transmitter aerial, computer, telemetry, The launch was successful and it was evident that the missile was obeying the transmitted commands. The torpedo parachuted away from its carrier and landed in the target area. The missile parachute operated successfully. The flotation bag can be observed inflated above the parachute. Further firings confirmed the system capability. Aboard Stuart, all is ready for the sea trials. Tracker aerial, transmitter aerial, the launcher. Target instrumentation has been set up on this island. Stuart moves to her firing position. The missiles are away. trials are brought to a successful conclusion. The trials were indeed brought to a successful conclusion. They uh, did establish during the trials with Stuart that the, ship, that the uh, missile certainly could meet its, um, the uh, credentials for it. And at the same time that the trials were undergoing, <clears throat> were being undertaken, excuse me, Admiral Burrell was overseas investigating the possibility of Australia purchasing air warfare destroyers. And this was intended as a cover 
just in case the Defence Committee determined that the carriers should be retired from service. Now, Burrell originally was interested in the county class destroyer. However, he rejected this because he was unimpressed with the sea slug anti-aircraft missile system on board. This led him then to the Charles F. Adams class destroyers, which were more to the liking of the RAN due to the uh, more efficient Tartar um, air warfare system. Gorton was a, um, again, enthusiastic with regarding the purchase of these particular uh, vessels, two to start with later three, and he announced the order on the 28th of August, 1961. Now, at this time, ICARA had been battled somewhat, or buffeted, I should say, by continuing discussion in the Defence Committee as to whether it should be authorised for general production. However, events beyond Australia eventually ensured that this would occur. And these were namely the political situation or changing geopolitical situation in Southeast Asia, given the insurgency, the growing insurgency in Vietnam, and most particularly the um, growth of Indonesian nationalism, which expressed itself in the dispute over uh, Dutch New Guinea, and arising from that, what was, became known as Confrontasi, which was, organ, which was orchestrated by President Sukarno. And the Australian government was quite naturally alarmed at Sukarno's bellicosity. And the result being that in November 1964, a previous uh, penny, penny saving was basically thrust aside and a very large uh, defence revamp undertaken across all three services and these budgetary uh, these budgetary decisions were announced in November 1964. ICARA itself entered general production in October 1965. Now with the general production of ICARA only one vessel which is coming up now HMAS Derwent was equipped from the start with the F1 analog system. And as you can see here, point of interest with uh, Derwin was that the missile housing and the magazine doors, which are clearly visible, the deck was open. It was not within a well, as you can see the, the, um, the limbo mortar system was in the well. And this would vary uh, depending on which the type 12s were eventually equipped. And we'll see some more photos in due course. Now, with the acquisition of the Adams class DDGs, the Australian government and the Navy were very keen that ICARA be placed, fitted aboard these ships. The ships themselves were built in the United States. And when the first of the ships was received, HMAS Perth, from the uh, Americans, it was found that the workmanship of the magazines in particular had been not particularly well attended to. And there are a number of faults that had to be overcome. Also, the problem of mating ICARA to the digital systems which were aboard the Adams class destroyers. And this necessitated the um, <clears throat> purchase of an American digital system. So this, the missile could be operated aboard the DDGs. And it turned out to be the main thrust of what became known as XTAC, because with the XTAC system, there was no longer the need for voice communication or morse of um, course correction updates. It all could be done automatically. So it was a far more mature system. And this was the first use of a digital computer warfare system within the Australian Defence Forces. Now, over the process, over the next couple of years, up to the point of general production, a number of other issues had to be overcome as well. And one of the most important, which was a backroom issue, was the absence, considerable absence, of documentation, both as to quality, quality control and maintenance, that was available for the officers and crews of the ships to use in the operation of the, the ICARA. And this lasted for quite some time. 
There was a lack of relevant documentation. There was no formalized training program. And there were conflicting views over quality control methods within the RAN itself. And you had the quite ludicrous situation in a number of the um, early examples where weapons officers would be sent off at very, very short notice with notebook and pencil to basically acquire the information as quickly as they could before the ship sailed. Now, let us move from there on to the operational lifespan of the missile, which lasted from 1966 up to 1991. Now, the ICARAs, <clears throat> here we have a picture of the uh, PERFs, the assembly on the um, DDG destroyers, which was somewhat different. They were placed amidships and just forward of the funnels. You can see that the magazine door there quite clearly. As for the production, this was mostly done within the government aircraft, aircraft factories and other associated uh, government and private facilities. And in concert with the assembly, at last the RAN got round to establishing a detailed support infrastructure. And this came through the introduction of what became known as RANITE or RANIT in the late 1960s, which was a dedicated ICARA training facility. And the, the establishment of munitions works or munitions facility at Kingswood known as RANME, R-A-N-M-M-E, for technical work to be taken out of ICARA's in service. Now, at this time, all of the um, RAN's um, type 12 frigates were to be equipped with ICARA um, <clears throat> along with the three DDGs. Now, in terms of production, the basic model remained as such until the 1980s. Uh, there were several uh, variants proposed. Now, this one here, the scale model of the box ICARA taken in the 1970s. And there was also a super ICARA, and these were to be increased range versions of the ICARA. And in the case of the box, ICARA was to be launched by a similar um, configuration to ASRA, doing away with the need for a magazine. However, these, uh, these um, initiatives were not followed for, for a variety of reasons, many of them to do with budget cuts, successive white papers, lack of private invest, uh, enterprise investment, and the driving down of production, especially during the 1970s due to the economic crisis, which resulted amongst other things of in 400 workers losing their jobs at the government aircraft factories, which did put a uh, fairly serious dent in production. As far as the service use went, in my research, the, the general, general results obtained both in trial firings and in firings both uh, when on station at Singapore and in the RIMPAC exercises off Hawaii were generally very favourable. The major problem that um, was to be experienced, and here we have ICARA being fired above Perth. This was the first public firing of ICARA. The major problems to be found were actually within the magazines, um, made, uh, specifically the sprinkler systems, the sensor systems, and the fact that the magazines tended to heat up to an inordinate temperature, especially where in the Far East, which would compromise the safety of the explosives on board and indeed would cause their decay. Um, the other problem that came to the surface in March 1968 uh, aboard HMAS Hobart was the construction of the magazine itself aboard the uh, DDG ships. A um, errant US missile which had been launched uh, by mistake at HMAS Hobart hit the ship, resulted in, I believe, two deaths, and also caused very serious damage to the uh, ICARA magazines, which were fortunately empty at the time. The, off, the ICARA missiles were not deployed. And on subsequent deployments by DDG ships to the Vietnam, this practice was followed because the ICARA magazines, which had been produced, constructed of steel aboard the Australian uh, Type 12s, 
had instead been built up by, um, from aluminium aboard, largely aluminium aboard the American ships. And this caused a, a real difficulty um, for the ship if uh, a direct hit was taken with Icaras in the magazine. Well, in fact, it would have likely resulted in the loss of the ship. Now, through the course of, and I'm just showing some slides here of some of the practice firings, during the course of the Icaras career aboard, there were several, actually quite a number of quite noticeable, notable incidents. And I'd like to refer to two of them now. The first of these took place aboard HMAS Derwent on the 27th of uh, January 1966 off Jarvis Bay. Now, Derwent was meant to be testing in concert with a company with a number, number of other ships testing her ICARAs. The test was delayed because of the detection of a what was believed to be a um, foreign submarine within the test zone. And um, after the, the submarine was either shooed off or left, uh, Derwent commenced the test and on the 27th, and it was described as follows, and I will just read this to you. As the final 10 seconds was counted, an air of great expectancy stilled the ship, followed by a great burst of cheering from the crew on the forecastle as the missile roared off the launcher. However, life was never meant to be easy. The missile, while still climbing in a boost phase, some 200 metres from the ship, performed a violent manoeuvre and started to disintegrate. The roar from the ship's company on the forecastle was profound in its implications. The reaction from command elements on the bridge distinctly less enthusiastic. The airspace in the vicinity of the missile became a mass of debris intermixed with the tail fin, wings, torpedo payload with parachute deployed and a still burning rocket motor descending towards the sea. As the last of the debris dis disappeared beneath the waves, quietness descended on the assembled companies. But the highlight of the day was still to come. After a delay of some 20 seconds, without warning, the rocket motor still burning burst from the sea with a thunderous roar and a thoroughly erratic flight path proceeded towards moon orbit. This unexpected bonus was greeted with a roar from the folks or similar to a winning goal being scored in the last minute of a cup final, a view not universally popular on the bridge. The other account was of an ICARA success, though not strictly intended. And it comes from the rather bland official language this time of the records of proceedings. This was in relation to HMA Swan and a firing on the 19th of April, 1977. Quote, HMA Swan and HMA Stewart rendezvous with HMAS Oxley at 0600 that day with HMA Swan firing successfully at 10.30 hours. A failure in the attack cutoff me mechanism in the Mark 44 practice torpedo resulted in the torpedo hitting HMAS Oxley. A subsequent headline in the Australian proclaimed Navy sinks a sub its own. And these were basically the two extremes of the experiences of the crews that were tasked with <clears throat> maintaining and firing our car. But despite uh, a number of failures, and this was to be expected in, a, in a, such a high tech weapon system, generally, as I explained before, the results were extremely good and the Americans particularly, and, and the Royal Navy, were both very impressed with the uh, capabilities of uh, ICARA when used in joint exercises. Now, the operational lifespan of ICARA in Australian service basically ended extremely abruptly in 1991 without any notice whatsoever. Um, it had been determined by the senior <clears throat> hierarchy within the Navy and the government that in the post-war era, both the CCAT and ICARA were now surplus to requirements. And within a very, very short period of time following a directive, not only were the ICARAs dismantled and removed from the ships, but the ICARA production line and all associate, associated facilities were basically disbanded. And within a year, most of the ICARAs had disappeared from view. It was extremely rapid. It was uh, demobilization of ICARA. It was certainly resented at a number of levels, not only within the RAN, but also within the civilian contractors and the workforces. It was regarded as a highly capable weapons system that had basically been dropped 
for budgetary reasons and also the end of the Cold War. To the extent that within a few years, only a handful of ICARAs were left. And today there are a few examples to be found in museums. There is one prominently on Scott on display at Garden Island. And um, aside from that, it has been fairly well lost from history. Now, one area of the ICARA story <clears throat> may well have closed with the Australia in 1991 for Australia, but ICARA also turned out to be a very successful export to, to the uh, Royal Navy in particular. And the British had been interested in ICARA and had participated in the ICARA program as, as far back as 1960. And uh, following a lengthy program, they, um, the British naval staff issued their own um, uh, uh, um, specification for ICARA, which had certain changes from the um, Australian version to fit in with uh, the electronic uh, requirements of uh, NATO warships. And these included the guidance requirements. And now we have another short video as soon as we go past HMS, Tor HMS Torrens, which I put in for the example, as you can see here, this is the well. You can see quite clearly the up the uh, rear deck, instead of being flat after the Arcara is, the Arcara and the Limbo are both contained in well. And here we have our second video, which I will now indicate about the, uh, what became known as the RNIK, ICARA for service on board HMS Leander and other Leander class ships. And I'll just run this now. Ahead of the finish, 10 9. HMS Leander at sea on a special anti submarine exercise. The Wasp helicopter seeks out the enemy before the attack. With the new ICARA anti-submarine missile fitted with a complex computerized fire control system and a homing device, the Leander can attack fast-moving submarines at great range and with deadly accuracy. After nearly two years in Devonport Dockyard undergoing a refit, the Leander is the first of a number of similar ships with this capability. With such sophisticated weapons, Britain's Navy keeps watch under the sea as well as above it. But having fired the rocket, it's sometimes necessary to recover it. And that's where Morgan the Killer Whale comes in. As we can see, the uh, HMAS Leander was eventually equipped with the ICARA in 1973. And a total of, just looking for pieces of paper here, total of uh, eight Leander class vessels and the lead class of a new destroyer class known as uh, um, HMS, HMS Bristol, I apologize, uh, was also equipped. However, Bristol was to be the only ship of its class, uh, and the, cla the remainder of the class being cancelled with a lot of, with a, a number of other um, military projects by the British in the mid 1960s. Now, this is an RM IK of Cara Cutaway. It's probable, it gives an excellent uh, view as to the general uh, configuration of the weapon. It was generally, and also from out, uh, both from outwardly and inwardly, fairly similar to the Australian weapon, um, except for the changes in electronics and certain other requirements as I detailed before. Now, one of the major interests that the British had in acquiring ICARA was what they described as its ability to carry a, quote, special weapon load. And the special weapon load meant carrying nuclear weapons. And there were three nuclear weapons that an ICARA could carry. They would be either a fire wave, a torpedo warhead, a depth bomb, or a depth charge. Now, the British were particularly interested in this because of the situation with the very large Soviet submarine presence in the, in the North Atlantic. However, the, and also the fact that ICARA did 
provide as a solution to one of the central problems with using tactical nuclear weapons at sea. Our, and we will, which we will come to very shortly. Um, HMS Galatea, as you can see here, um, you can see quite clearly for where the gun was would be usually mounted in the Australian Type 12s. You can see the well where the missile, and in fact, you can see the warhead just pointing out at itself. And here is another photo of Icara aboard Bristol. The pointer is, is the dome, a canvas dome or a made of canvas or other material fiberglass was placed over the ship uh, to uh, prevent uh, damage from seas. Now, returning to the, the nuclear question for a moment, the picture on screen at the moment shows a test known as Operation Swordfish, which is undertaken in May 1962 by the Americans. And this quite graphically illustrates the dangers of detonating nuclear weapons close to the ships that actually fire them. This destroyer in the foreground here is approximately for between somewhere between three and five nautical miles. And the blast in this picture when taken was not fully developed. The major hazard for destroyers conducting nuclear attacks against uh, submarines was, as I'm pointing out here, what was known as the base surge. When the columns of water collapsed, they would move out at a, a, a extremely fast rate. And if a ship was caught within reasonable distance, perhaps a mile or so, or indeed was um, <clears throat> came into contact with spray from the explosion, that ship would be contaminated. And it was known from previous nuclear tests that the amount of radiation um, at close range was sufficient to kill or incapacitate the majority of the crew. So standoff was best, best, basically the best option for nuclear. And if we go on here, we can see the nuclear delivery methods. And one can see the obvious um, improvement that ICARA gave over ASROC in terms of range. 10 nautical miles as confirmed with five. And in studies undertaken by the um, British MOD, which have only been recently declassified, ICARA was recommended as the, um, as the, as the better nuclear carrier because it was estimated that the um, radiation received from a distance of 10 nautical miles would be significantly less lethal than that received from five or less. Now, the, the British were not the only uh, country to receive ICARA. New Zealand received one, which was already installed in HMS Dido when she became HMNZS Southland. Perhaps, but more significant than that was the sale of the ICARAs to Brazil. And these were to be placed on four of the Notario class frigates. And we have a Notario class here. The ICARA was originally placed on the rear deck. It was superseded by uh, the Bo a BOFA system uh, later in life. And the Brazilians uh, received these from, no uh, from 1973 uh, when the contract was signed they, uh, and they were delivered some, uh, several years later and they remained in service till the early 1990s. Now, part of the ICARA story also involved the orders that didn't quite make it because a number of countries were very keen on this system, most notably the Japanese. And the Japanese for a considerable period in the late 1960s were favorably disposed to getting ICARA. Instead, eventually they stayed with uh, their brand loyalty and took ASROC instead. A number of European countries, including France, Germany, the Netherlands, and Italy, were likewise interested at various points, but these did not go. These uh, negotiations did not go through. Also, uh, expressing uh, interest were uh, South Africa and Iran. That was Iran, um, while still under the rule of the Shah, and uh, unfortunately, these didn't go through either. But at, at the very least, Icara had had shown that it could attract interest from overseas buyers, as it did from the British and the Brazilians, and as such was an extremely worthwhile defence export on Australia's part. Now, to conclude this uh, presentation, or at least my part of it, um, I thought we'd have a brief look 
at what ICARA was actually intended to fight. And when ICARA was invented in the early 1960s, it was constructed in the early 1960s, the opposition submarines would invariably be constructed, designed, and built in the Soviet Union or built in China under a license from the Soviet Union. Now, all Soviet submarines in the post-war era were based on the Type 21 U-boat. This ended uh, service very late in the war, too late to have a major impact. And its major advantage over every other submarine at the time was its hull shape and also its snorkel, which allowed it to remain below the surface while it was recharging its batteries and gave it a very significant advantage in avoiding any submarine war aircraft in particular. Now, Stalin, who was quite a well-read man, uh, realised that the only way that the Soviet Union could compete in the post-war environment with the United States was by having a large navy. And he was something of a disciple of the ideas of uh, Alfred Mahan and a number of other um, classical naval theorists when it came to uh, navies and global empires. So Stalin set in train a massive increase in the Soviet conventional and nuclear submarine fleets. Now, one of the first examples of this is a 1950s vessel called the Whiskey Class, a <coughs> diesel electric, pardon me, diesel electric boat. The most significant uh, figures, features of which you can see here are the side mounted missile tubes. Um, these actually had to be launched on the surface. Missiles had to be launched on the surface. And they would rotate up and forward. And this made the whiskey extremely vulnerable to, uh, especially to any form of interception, if it was attempting to surface and fire its missiles. Now, in the early stages, the Soviet, various Soviet submarine projects suffered from undue haste in two ways. And that was very poor quality control, especially when it came to system safety systems and the advancement of immature um, variants of onboard nuclear reactors. Now, the following two submarines types, which they introduce, this being the November attack class submarine, 1958, and the Echo class cruise missile submarine in 1958. And if you observe on the Echo, it too has missile tubes on its side, except they are flush. These were two of the more common submarines that the ICARA would have commented would have uh, come into contact with if the Cold War had gone hot. hot. Uh, these two submarines in particular had atrocious safety records, numerous accidents involving short circuits and explosions with the electronics, and also quite a number of uh, reactor malfunctions, which resulted in the deaths of over 100 Soviet sailors, and also due to poor quality control, uh, quite a number of Soviet dockyard workers uh, lost their lives in the production of these vessels. Now, during the 60s, the Soviets, or during the mid-60s, the Soviets had begun to get their act together and were producing far more efficient attack submarines. And the first of these, one of the first of these, was the Charlie class, 1965. It's quite an unusual photograph, this one, because you can see the Charlie class with the white ensign on, ensign on top of it. It's actually, um, it was, uh, this particular boat was transferred from the Russian Navy to the Indian Navy for technology tests. As you can see, it's uh, a far more streamlined design than the previous designs and somewhat smaller as well. And the high point of a number of Soviet boats, which included the Sierra class, the Victor class, and the Alpha class was the 1983 um, introduction of the Akula class. Now this submarine was extremely difficult to detect. It was about the size of a Los Angeles class submarine and it was extremely fast. And that made it a very formidable opponent for ICARA because of its, particularly because of its speed underwater. However, the two submarines, which in a sense made ICARA and for that matter, uh, ASROC and Malafon and other ASW systems from warships in a sense obsolete were the next two which will come into view. The first of these being the Oscar class, well known as a, a member of the Oscar class was the ill-fated submarine Kursk, which was uh, sunken 
uh, sunk due to a uh, malfunction of one of its torpedoes. Now, as you can tell, this is a truly massive submarine, much wider, much larger than the um, Los Angeles class. And it had a total submerged displacement of 19,000 tonnes. And essentially, you would need more than one torpedo to uh, guarantee the destruction of a submarine of this size. The submarine was intempted, uh, intended for a number of purposes, uh, most uh, notably to engage US carrier battle groups at long range. And this, again, uh, caused the, um, the obsolescence, if you like, of the ICARA because the Oscar and a number of the other boats of this period were equipped with long range anti-ship missiles, meaning that they could launch them at ranges up to hundred miles from the, um, from the targets and making them far more difficult to intercept. However, the most difficult targets of all to intercept for ICARA and the other ASW weaponry were the Soviet uh, ballistic missile submarines. And the biggest of these was a true monster known as the Typhoon. Six of these were constructed. It had a base weight of 23,200 tonnes and a submerged weight of 48,000 tonnes, which was the equivalent of the Bismarck and the Tirpitz of World War II fame. And this was a truly horrendous piece of weaponry because it carried uh, 20 uh, submarine launched ballistic missiles. Each missile carried 10 warheads and a single Typhoon submarine was more than capable of basically annihilating every population center and major military base in Australia if the opportunity had arisen. And so this was the ultimate weapon for ICAR to face. Thankfully, that never took place. But in the end result, despite the size of weapon of Soviet submarines such as this, ICARA turned out to be an extremely efficient system. It was well capable of doing the tasks it was in, it, it expected to do. It was retired prematurely, certainly in the view of, of, of this author. Um, and it really did demonstrate just how good Australian manufacturing technology could be when adequate resources were uh, provided and the right people were involved in the planning programs. And it is on that note, now that I return to the split screen, and I trust that you have enjoyed this slide presentation. Uh, what uh, replaced the ICARA then as the uh, anti submarine warfare um, predominant agent? I'm not sure absolutely certain of the weapon type. Um, there have been no other Australian projects since then, so I'm actually presuming that it would be it would be ASROC or a variant, possibly a variant of Harpoon, but certainly nothing like ICARA. Can I come in there as a former anti-submarine specialist in the RAN? It's David Cunningham speaking. Um, there really wasn't a, a replacement um, um, of the same type. Um, the operational answer was that um, helicopters um, uh, would carry yes. um, the same sort of torpedoes, Mark 44s, Mark 46s back then. Um, and uh, yeah, they would be able to, to deliver them uh, close enough to the submarine, hopefully, um, for a successful attack. Could I just add a footnote to David's comment as well? Also, I had experience serving in ICARA ships, um, Torrens, when she commissioned Brisbane. And also, I was SW officer of Brit by Carol Leander, too. So I have a bit of familiarity with it. And in later times, I worked in the Directorate of Underwater Weapons in Canberra in the early 80s, which is the time around which um, decisions were being considered on the future of a system called Illaru, which was an update to the ICARA tracking and guidance system that would give the missile uh, a much greater range than it had under its normal configuration. In fact, it was thought that it could be tracked out to a hundred, tracked and operated out to a hundred kilometres. Uh, it would still, however, be delivering the same torpedo. Um, the, the missile itself could fly that far, but the torpedo didn't really change. And I think one of the other causes for demise, when the decision was made that we would do away with the uh, the carrier, we no longer had a platform for ASW dipping sonars for some years anyway. Uh, so the the ability to provide target information at long range for the ICARA system 
uh, had begun to evaporate. Uh, and it wasn't until we started to get into the current sort of uh, Romeo class, um, the Romeo that we now carry at sea um, in the uh, in our more modern frigates, that we've got a dipping sonar at sea that can provide target information for a system. We now no longer have the system. Can I just add to that um, one thing? I did not include. I did not actually go to some of the variants of ICARA. There were there were variants, um, Tirana and Wamba, but also it was yeah. it was also um, ICARA was assisted by the development of the Malika Sonar system, which proved yeah. to be uh, fairly successful. Yeah, but again, that was that was a relatively short range yes. sonar system. Um, um, the, the only sonar system that gave you a good long range detection if the if the conditions the water conditions were right was of course the sqs 23 in the yes. in the ddgs and you could get a detection potentially out to twenty thousand yards but uh, that was not not the norm well they also tried a um system i believe a canadian system which was a bit of a disaster which turned out to be a bit of a disaster um i think it was the i just can't remember it was sq um, it was an SQ system from Canada, which was dis was was uh, towed sonar array, which was um, discarded fairly quickly because of um, difficulties with the with the electronics. Um, can I come in back with a question? It's David Cunningham again. Um, Please. The um, operational effectiveness. Um, um, I noticed there's a Don Stewart um, attending this, um, and I, if that's a Don Stewart to um, was in charge of runtime for many years. Uh, he might have some information on um, the percentage of successful um, practice firings um, of ICARA. Um, there were very few uh, practice firings. Um, uh, the, you know, the annual allowance in peacetime was minimal. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that um, we achieved overall a very uh, high effective rate. Can Don answer that? I suppose the ICARA was a precursor of our drones now, in a way. Uh, it... Yes. Uh, and also on that matter of um, also on the matter of successful launches, that's David brings up. That's that's quite correct. The the average amount of launches, I think, over a peri over period was for each ship was probably in the vicinity of ten to twelve. They they didn't they didn't conduct that many. Um, that's right. There were not not as many trial launches. I remember when I was on Vampire and uh, the, there was a test firing in Jarvis Bay, and I saw the Icara take off, but it, it, it sort of that doesn't last very long, unfortunately, with a ten kilometer radius. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it certainly doesn't. Um, it looks impressive on takeoff, and uh, but I think that's the problem with it, isn't it? The the range. Well, yeah, and they, and they were all they were all short range. I mean, you could get up to twenty thousand yards. Asrock and Malafon were considerably shorter than that, and and it, it was interesting actually that the that the Soviets, for their part, never really attempted that. The Soviets had knowledge of ICARA, but they never really attempted to make any a, a sort of analog in their own anti-submarine uh, warfare missiles, which were like uh, um, Asrock and. Um, Malafon were very short range. I, I was involved in a number of uh, firings over the years uh, as Deputy WEO, WEO and uh, Trials Officer, and uh, I, I never did the statistics, but we, I would be guessing uh, that we probably had about a 60 or 70% success rate, maybe, mm. uh, out of those practice firings. Um, but so it was, it was generally okay, but we had a few, certainly a few disastrous ones as well. <laughs> uh, I can, uh, well, one small thing, the, uh, the that Canadian sonar you're talking about was the, I think, the AN SQS 504. That's right, yes. Sonar, and we had that in Derwent. And um, it was the main problem that we had. Oh, we had problems with the electronics, but the main problem was the, the towing system and the cable. Yes and the fairing and the uh, sort of streamlining fairing on the cable mm -hmm. inevitably broke or got tangled and it was just a huge problem to, to operate. Uh, well, well, one of the accounts I found on the operation of that sonar was suggested um, 
that it made a uh, much better children's flotation toy than it did a uh, sonar. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, maybe it was suitable as some sort of weapon to to try and strike the submarine with, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it was pretty. It was pretty hopeless. And 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 from my experience back then, and and your excellent presentation and your excellent book uh, brought back a whole lot of memories about the problems with the documentation and the training and uh, that sort of thing. Um, it it certainly brought home to me as a, as a young maintainer that the importance of good maintenance documentation and uh, we had <laughs> sorts of problems with those, uh, with the ICARA documentation in those early days anyway. Mm. Uh, it was a real problem. And well, that's a, that seemed to be the major um, complaint from mm -hmm. um, most of the contributors that went, went into the book was that, um, yes, the, it was just non-existent. It was almost as if they just, it had been an afterthought. And uh, from what I understand, that, that there was one of the ships deployed overseas where the spares for ICAR were actually loaded on in a duffel bag, basically whatever they could find. Mm -hmm. And um, so there were, yeah, there were certainly were problems with the logistics and certainly with the training early on, yes, until the establishment of the training facility. Yes, and uh, I remember in those early days I was involved in, um, I remember at least one meeting up at the Navy office about ICARA training, and um, I, I, I ventured to suggest at that meeting that, that there should be some connection between training and career progression for the sailors. Mm -hmm. and that uh, the training and the postings and the promotion people should all work together. But that idea at that, at that time was rather poo-pooed. Uh, I was told this was seriously, strictly a meeting about training, nothing to do with postings, nothing to do with career progression. So, yes. But, but I, I think a lot of those problems were sorted out uh, by the end. Well, it, it, I think it was like most missile projects that, that there were always going to be toofing troubles. I mean, I... I watched sure. um, footage, for instance, of the V2 program. I mean, for every V2 that flew, um, at least 10 would at least ten would go up in the air and come straight back down again. Um, it, it must have... Working with ballistics would be incredibly, I imagine, incredibly frustrating because it, it just requires such precision in their operation to make the whole, the whole thing work. And, and um, you probably see that from footage of test bloopers at, at Woomera and also those run by the United States when they're trying to catch up with Sputnik. Yes, yes, that's right. We, we had, I can remember one, um, one incident which was sort of amusing where we, um, in, in Derwent, we were at RIMPAC and I think you mentioned uh, that, that visit in your book um, and we fired a number of missiles and uh, one of them, was sort of almost successful, but it wasn't really because what and the old analog system, yeah. Um, the uh, we we fired the missile, and uh, what we didn't realise uh, in time was that the the range servo, the missile range servo on the computer was stuck. Now the missile range servo tracked the the range of the, how far the missile was on its way, and when it got to the release point, it it generated a signal. To release the torpedo, mm. it got stuck on zero the, the servo, so the missile just kept going and going and going and going. And I, I wish I could remember how far it went. It, it got to about twenty-five or thirty thousand yards, I think. And uh, before it got out, we hoped it impressed the Americans with the with the potential range of the system. <laughs> what happened was uh, I was down in the ICAR equipment room, and and when we realised that the torpedo hadn't been released. The maintainer and I both, I think, simultaneously saw the range servo was stuck. The maintainer gave the computer a mighty whack with his fist, <laughs> loosened it, and away it went. <laughs> there we go. That's that's the way to do a technology. That's the way. A big, Absolutely. Big with a fist. <laughs> that's right. Just give it a good give it a good clout. Have we ever had a presentation on a CCAT system? The CCAT. I had, I had a lot of experience with CCAT. Yes, I. I I don't have much knowledge except my own personal experience, which was, it was, um, I sometimes think it was a bit like Krakenite or something like that, trying to fire missiles, fire CCAT missiles, but uh, uh, it, it, it was full of 
full of fun and disasters, just like Okara. Well, there was a, one account in the book that um, where they did a joint firing, I think, on the same day, and the um, the Icara uh, crashed, and the Sea Cat missile um, crew had an awful lot of fun over that until they launched theirs, and theirs crashed at the same time. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, yes, it was it was all good fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David Cunningham again, I think. Um, Back to the discussion about the variable depth uh, sonar, the uh, Canadian one. Um, I, I, I can't disagree that uh, it proved to be very unreliable, but we need to understand that um, the uh, the need to um, get a sonar set uh, deep below the surface layer uh, in order to get decent ranges um, on mm -hmm. submarines uh, was critically important. Um, and that um, takes us back to uh, the helicopter situation, which uh, Andrew McKinnon uh, uh, quite uh, correctly mentioned as being uh, uh, really critical. Um, it's the, the input of um, decent um, target information, uh, the whereabouts and, and the uh, movement of the submarine, which is critical to the whole exercise. And that's always been extremely difficult and the longer range you're trying to work at, then um, the more inaccurate the information is and the more variable it is. Um, you don't get continuous tracking of a submarine like you uh, hope to do with an aircraft target. Um, you'll get uh, fleeting, erratic and uncertain um, uh, <laughs> information on where you, what you think is a target and where it might be and where it might be going. And the best answer has been um, the, uh, the the dipping sonar, and therefore very important that um, that's that's part of the uh, the whole process uh, that you get a uh, an aircraft um, to get close enough to the submarine to track it accurately, and uh, you get surf ships uh, as far away from the submarine as you possibly can. Well, the um, <clears throat> originally the British had a system called a match system which involved helicopters. But I think one of the reasons they went for Icara over helicopters, the reason, one of the reasons they went for Icara was that it was all weather. Um, the, and I think at least originally it was thought that a helicopter system, helicopter-based system would suffer from that problem that you couldn't launch helicopters in all weather. But later on, of course, it was married perfectly successfully. and. Uh, that's that's absolutely right. If you can't get a decent fix, and I think that was that was a real problem that perhaps they never completely solved was getting a decent was getting decent fixes, decent fixes enough to actually get the torpedo on target. And the other problem, of course, was actually when they hit the submarine, hitting the submarine in the right place. If if you hit um, something like a typhoon or an Oscar in, in the wrong place, it'd just bounce off. Or, the, or because they were double hulled. In the case of the typhoon, they were two hulls joined together. Um, so really, you you had to get a, a pretty accurate hit, I would presume, presumably uh, near the propeller shafts to rupture the hull. Uh, that was it was a, a fairly difficult, uh, fairly difficult undertaking. Let alone the sonar problem, which must have been horrendous. Probably more so horrendous for the for the Soviets than the Americans, given that a lot of the so one drawback of a lot of the early Soviet boats was they're extremely noisy. Yeah, you're, you're right, Angus. It's a basic problem with any um, air-launched um, anti-submarine torpedo is that um, um, the aircraft can't carry them if they're too heavy, um, mm -hmm. therefore they're going to be small. And you're not really um, um, hoping to get um, a rupture of the pressure hull, um, particularly against those uh, bigger deep diving uh, submarines. Um, you're hoping it'll home on the noise and uh, it will disable or, or, or reduce the ability by damaging uh, propellers and, uh, and rudders and planes. Well, that's absolutely right. And, and, and in fact, there've been a number of, um, in the post-war, um, in the post-Cold War um, period, a number of um, American admirals have, have been on the record stating that the reason they um, wanted nuclear weapons to deal with um, submarines is they felt that when it came to deal with ballistic missile submarines, 
much as the Soviets tried to deal with their very, the American aircraft carriers that only a nuclear weapon would do the job. And um, it actually answers, it actually opens a very interesting discussion on how um, nuclear weapons would have been used uh, at sea, given the um, given the various uh, first use arrangements, well, the first use declarations which were in force. Uh, I, I actually wouldn't mind in the future doing a, a presentation on on the use of nuclear weapons at sea, and especially with any submarine, because it, it does pose a number of very interesting tactical and strategic questions. You, well, you will. I'll do it. Uh, it'll be uh, uh, all the anti-submarine, all the, all the um, nuclear underwater tests conducted by the US with submarine warfare. There's quite a few of them, so um, it'll make it make interesting watching. I think. If you've got any, um, if you've got any questions that, that come up or anything you'd like to discuss about ICAR or any other missile systems, please uh, you just contact David at the at the society. He'll give you my email address, and, and please feel free to. Give me an email. I'm always very happy to answer questions or discuss um, a lot of issues. And, and, and that was one of the things I got during the writing of the book. For instance, I had an ex, was contacted eventually by an ex-fleet air arm pilot who took me through the um, took me the, through the fun and games of actually uh, testing the launching uh, mechanism for the ICARA torpedo from a sea venom, which uh, would have been fairly interesting, very loud, I'd imagine. Um, and there's, that's the really interesting thing about ICAR is that there are so many little side issues that you can go and have a look at, uh, and particularly with the um, particularly with the um, involvement of the private enterprise contractor partners, especially EMI with um, the guidance system, which was totally revolutionary at that time. I mean, no, no other. I, I don't believe there was anything like it within either NATO or or the Warsaw Pact. That's right. I totally agree. I also I had a lot of admiration for uh, CAC, who made the magazine yes. system, uh, and being the, as I saw it anyway, being an aircraft corporation, mm. all their hydraulics was look as I understood it was built pretty well, much to aircraft standards. So it was mm. uh, very high quality uh, hydraulics uh, in, in that system. Well, perhaps it should be. You know, it's, it's interesting that you raise that because there's. In a way, if you think about it, for a minute, perhaps it shouldn't be really called a missile. Perhaps it was a drone torpedo bomber, because that's in a, in a sense what it was. It was like a Grumman Avenger or a fairy sword, fish, fairy sword fish. The only difference was it didn't come back, but it could be recovered, of course. And um, it, perhaps it more properly would be known as a drone torpedo bomber. And given now, I think there's even more relevance to ICARA now, given the uh, advances in drone warfare that we're seeing, and we are certainly seeing them, what's happened in the Ukraine, where they're using low-cost drones have inflicted dreadful casualties on the Soviet armour and mechanised infantry. And uh, the, with the whole progression of, of warfare towards drone technology in the 21st century, I, I think the lessons from my car are even more important today than in some respects than they were in 1959. Fantastic. I read the book with Thank you. interest and it brought back up a, a lot of memories. And uh, and the presentation, I thought, was really, really excellent and summarised it all beautifully. Thank you. And I hope, to, I hope to improve it a bit next time. <laughs> no, I, you've given me the appetite now. I, I love it, this sort of way of communicating history to me is, is fantastic because the more people you get interested, that's how you keep history sustained and... That's the object of ICARA and every, I presume every other Zoom presentation. Keep the history there because if we lose it, it'd be a terrible thing.